and this is Passport Necessary, a podcast dedicated to growing up as a TCK and how it's affecting us now as adults. And today I am very excited to introduce our guest. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you for having me to start. My name is Shai Zumar and uh, yeah, should I just start with like where I've lived or like <laughs> or, or am I a TCK? <laughs> Whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, whatever you want. Usually, yeah. What are you, what's your nationality and where you've lived? That's usually the first question. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I'm a Honduran Palestinian. I have both nationalities from Honduras and Palestine. And I was born and grew up in Honduras, but I would spend almost every single summer, which I could, in uh, Palestine. So, I guess that was like my childhood. But then after I turned 18, I moved to the United States and now I live in Belgium. So I've, you know, try to move as much as possible as well after, <laughs> after my childhood. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So I guess I'm just curious, um, how is it that your parents, mo- is, what, did they move to Honduras? Do you have one parent who's Honduranian and another parent who's Palestinian? Or how did it come that you grew up in H- Honduras? So this is like a, a really interesting uh, story, actually. And I was like even more, I was like extremely interested in also my my father's story primarily because I even read a book, like an, an academic anthropology book on like Palestinians in Honduras. But my dad actually was born in Honduras, even though he didn't know uh, back in nine. Yeah, like in 1924, I had a really old parent, uh, old, old father. And um, he moved back to Palestine during the British mandate. So before like, you know, the state of Israel even existed. After World War II, he was trying to find a place to live and he was thinking about moving to Canada, but he ended up moving back to Honduras by accident because his uncle lived there. Uh, when he re- when he got there, he realized like, oh man, I'm also Honduran because he realized he was actually born there with his like paperwork. And that makes you a Honduran citizen by default because Honduras has a, you know, citizenship by birth. And he decided, you know, I'm just going to stay here because, uh, you know, how difficult sometimes <laughs> it is to get papers. I think TCK individuals would understand how difficult it is to migrate to a country. So he took the opportunity, you know, like, just knowing that he was actually born there. Mom, I, eventually he married my mom uh, much later and then she moved from from Palestine to Honduras with him. She had never actually been to Honduras before, so which, that was like a really big move for her <laughs> as well. Yeah, that's that's really huge to leave the only country you've known and then all of a sudden be in a completely different country. Um, so I... It's also interesting that you still have a sort of like several generations of people moving around. It just seems to be a thing. I don't know because my parents have moved, Layla's parents have moved. It's just an interesting thing that you know there tend to be a couple of generations that will do it rather than just one. Oh yeah, and I think I think for sure, like for me, I've always looked back to like my dad's example. You know, if he did it, if he risked so much back in the day where internet didn't exist, you know, like you had to send telegrams mm-hmm. sometimes and stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, why would I not do it? I always think about that as well. That's always been like a motivating factor for me mm. personally. And uh, a lot of friends who've actually moved as well uh, from people I know from my undergrad studies and stuff, they always tend to cite their parents as well. Uh, I think I think I agree with you mm. fully. Like it, it, I think it sets a precedence and, and it makes it a lot more accessible like mentally to people. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. I guess a question I have for you, because I, I know this is always a term that's very hard for tck's to define i know for me it's very hard um is what is home for you um i actually have a very funny story based on that question because when i was in college uh one of my friends i was going for thanksgiving break and i wrote to them i was like oh i'm coming home i'm going home and he goes wait home in Algeria, because my parents were living in Algeria at the time, <laughs> home New York City, because my godmother was in New York City, or home the school that you're staying at right now. And I was like, that's a good clarifying question. Um, I'm coming back to the school. He was like, okay, just so I know where your location is in case you go missing. I was like, <laughs> morbid, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, I guess for me, it's pretty simple. I'd argue like home... Um is not specifically Honduras, but even more specifically, like the city of San Pedro Sula, because my parents weren't ones who actually would take me around Honduras a lot. I always felt like that was one of the things that I always felt very different between me and other people. It's like, there would be a lot of internal tourism, right? And then my parents would be like, the summer's around, we're going back to Palestine. I was like, okay, you know, so I would just, you know, miss out on all the summer and all the possibilities of hanging out in Honduras. But for me, home is definitely San Pedro Sula. I've come to feel very different of that recently. Uh, because I've lived uh, outside San Pedro since I've been I've been a teen. I'm 25 now, so like it's been a couple of years. And every single time I go back, I do realize like, oh man, you know, like this. Yeah, this was my childhood home, but but it feels like there is less to return to every single time. My parent, my my mom and my brother still live there. Uh, but to be honest, that's like what makes me 
just go home. Like I, I, to be, I think if my mom and my brother wouldn't live there, I would just not be back. Mm-hmm. 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 So it's more, it's the idea of that was home because that's where you grew up, but it's not home as in like a physical space that you constantly want to return to other than the people who are there. Yeah, I think I think that's been the case more and more. I do miss my my room specifically sometimes from my childhood, which I I always thought it's a really weird thing to miss, but uh, but yeah, but like exactly what you reference, it's it's more like uh, I I miss the people, and every single time I'm there, it just feels a bit more foreign to me. Mm-hmm. Mm. So I guess um, now that you're living in Belgium, which I'm sure is very different from where you've lived in before, how is it living in this country? Uh, versus when you were living in the States, when you were living in Honduras? You know, to be honest, Belgium is the first time I've, like, felt extremely foreigner. And this is, like, I guess uh, weird because you always always feel like, oh, you don't fit, right? Like, oh, man, yeah, it's weird. I guess my friends celebrate these things that way. I have a different religion or whatever and stuff like that. Um, But it's, like... I come to Belgium and it's, like... And I just recently moved back. I was here in 2000. 19 and then moved to California for a year and then I came back recently again to finish my studies and uh, And I went to the supermarket after being in the US a place. I'm really comfortable in um, For a year and I show up and I go to the supermarket and It's just I just couldn't read like what was on the on the tags, right? And I was just like wow, you know And that was again a reminder of like you can get more foreign than you already were You know, like you can truly right. <laughs> push it further. So so for me, that's been like the biggest realization of being in Belgium uh, I think I think it's interesting because um, ultimately, and I don't like to categorize countries as like West and East and stuff like that. I'm not a big, a big, uh, I'm not a big fan of that. But like, it is ultimately a European country. You know, it's a Western European country, so it has a lot of similarities to like, yeah, again, just uh, countries which like the United States that have like big uh, meat outputs, right? That are that you can actually experience through like movies and stuff. So it's not that different to be here. But the, the biggest difference is the is the language barrier i mean yeah there's interactions with individuals mm-hmm. what the expectations at work are university are like expectations for with relationships and friendships are different i guess a bit but i've never felt that they're like per se extremely different they're more like quirky if you want to mm-hmm. call it that way mm-hmm. but the language is just like what kills me that's for sure <laughs> 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 but people are proud you know to like speak flemish here uh so it's oh. it's even though everybody speaks english perfectly and i am immensely appreciative of that it's not the same, you know, like they just look at you as the foreigner. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I was going to say, I suppose, yeah, it's an interesting one because Flemish is one of those languages that nobody really talks about anywhere else apart from in Belgium. It's, it's the only place where it matters. Everywhere else, it's just like, nah. Yeah, and then a lot of people will just say it's Dutch, yeah. and then the and then a lot of the Belgians will be like, no, no, it's not Dutch, it's Flemish, and they'll try to make a difference. <laughs> and uh, and I mean, I'm not one to argue with that because I don't know anything, you know, about like the the specific <laughs> linguistics. So I'm not going to comment on that, but. Uh, but that's the whole point. It just, you know, it's, and it's just really weird because you're there in the supermarket and it, everything's written in like a million languages, but it's not like the whole language, you know, it's like either Flemish, German or <laughs> Dutch, right? Oh, sorry. Or, uh, or French. And you're like, well, I know, I at least personally don't know any of those three languages. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, I guess, I guess I chose the wrong country language wise to come to. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, that's really interesting. Why did you choose to move to Belgium? Um, so... I had like this, I guess, like anybody else, when I graduated, I had this really big crisis of what I wanted to do. And I knew some uh, Belgian researchers who did, who worked on sustainable metallurgy and materials. So that's what I do now. It's like I'm getting a master's degree in sustainable materials. And I'm interested in like knowing how to produce cleaner metals and how to recycle metals. That's like my interest. And, and Belgium is like the place to be apparently for that. So I got a pretty good, uh, nice deal. And I guess this is something as a TCK, you always sort of like know it's that there are benefits to doing some stages of your life in some places like cheaper graduate school. Uh, mm. So yeah. I was just like, yeah, definitely not paying grad school in the United States. I did undergrad there. It was expensive as hell. I'm out, you know. <laughs> so I came to Belgium and uh, I have no regrets in this matter whatsoever. I think the university is really prestigious and uh, and there's been really big like slap in the face sort of expectations because, you know, education in the United States is like, it is like a whole culture on itself and then i came here and there were like other things to expect so i hit a wall in that regard but again i think i i achieved the things i came to do which was to become an expert in in the field and and belgium is a very rigorous scientific country so um you know i i have no complaints in that in that regard Mm -hmm. that's why i moved ultimately and it was on a flim i had never been here before uh something new 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, I actually was a bit disappointed to realize how, like, to realize it wasn't that different. I guess I got here and and it was very naive of me because like, oh man, there's still subways, there's still buses, and I was like, what was I expecting? You know, like, how different can I really push different, right? Uh, and my friends were like, really, are you disappointed? And I'm like, yeah. I don't know. And I was becoming like really cynical. My friends were like, oh, you should go to Amsterdam. I'm like, ah, oh, but what is there in Amsterdam? More people just drinking and, and eating. Because I've come to realize there's a, if there's a universe, universal thing in the world is that people love to drink and eat. Uh, yeah. And if it, yeah, you know, uh, you know, drinking is a, uh, it can be any choice, right? Alcoholic, non-alcoholic, tea, coffee, or whatever. But the whole point is you'll find a bunch of people sitting around talking and drinking and eating. And when I showed up, I was like very cynical. I was like, come on, did I just move half around the world to do the same thing I was doing back home, <laughs> drinking and eating? <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, I've changed my mind slowly. I've come to realize there's bigger things than, than just those two things. <laughs> yeah. um. I suppose one of the things we do like to talk about on the podcast is food. Is there any particular kinds of foods or drinks that you actually enjoy in Belgium that you don't get elsewhere? Mm, um... That's hard. I don't. I mean, I don't want to insult, insult any Belgians, but I don't think Belgian food is particularly good for, at least for my taste. Um, and I think a lot of uh, Belgians, <laughs> Belgians will tell you directly, like, "Oh man, it sucks. Like, why did you come here?" And I've always been. I always thought, like, "Wow, how?" Because I think Belgium is a great country. Like, honestly, it's a great place to be, like, and to live. But like, a lot of Belgians just. Uh, I mean, from my experiences with a lot of like a lot of interactions with students, they tend to be very surprised that you chose this country to come. It's like, why this country out of all the countries? Like, and I try to remind them, like, yeah, you know, it's a really cool place. It's, uh, you know, like you guys know what's going, like, what's up? You have a really functioning society and stuff. Uh, mm. But that helps uh, for, usually. <laughs> yeah, but for me, like the biggest things that I've come to encounter here that I always thought have been amazing are like, well, beer. First of all, I live in Leuven, Belgium, which is like one of the world capitals of beer. It's like where Stella Artois is made, has like the biggest beer factory yep. in the world, I think. And then you get like all these Belgian triples and other types of Belgian beer. So that's been awesome. And uh, and then there's like a bunch of like random things, like the fries here are amazing. You know, like uh, just mm. like, you know, I don't want to call them French fries because I'll also offend well, people, but uh, <laughs> that's what Americans would call it. But you know, Belgian fries are amazing. And then they dip it in um, in this like beef stew. It's got, I, I, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation. It's called like Stoffles. And it's just a be- like a really thick beef stew. It's almost to the point that's a sauce, and you can like dip your fries in oh. it, and it's just oh, so, that good. so good. Yeah, it's so good. So like this is amazing here, and also the mayo is really good here because like, you know they don't dip their fries in uh, in uh, in ketchup. They do it for- they dip it in mayo. And I thought at the beginning, oh man, that that sounds horrible. And I tried it, and I was like, but wait, the mayo here is actually like the cheapest mayo is like the best mayo in the U.S. For example, <laughs> like it's just substantially better. <laughs> so I became like a mayo. Fan. And then when I moved back to the U.S. Uh, last year, I remember me trying to figure out if like, oh man, you know, like the the mayo that is actually at the standard of Belgium is like eight dollars a jar. And then I would still buy yep. it because it's like you know whatever. It's like I mayo is just such a good food. I, I missed that when I was in the U.S. Uh, but those are like simple pleasures I have here. Mm. I guess another one I'm I'm curious about is is there food that you miss from Honduras and from Palestine? Yeah. Um, so I mean, I've been I I like to cook a lot, so I've been recreating like almost all the Palestinian dishes that I like uh, so far. Uh, like the home versions, right? There's obviously like, and I think this is what people always forget. It's there's stuff that you can get at home and stuff you can get like in restaurants. And people always mm-hmm. have these perceptions of what like, you know, maybe in your case, like Jap- Japanese food. Like it's always whatever people serve in restaurants. Mm-hmm. But it's not like, that's not a good representation of like probably what people cook at home, right? Um, yeah. So for what people cook at home, I've been able to recreate that. But for Palestinian food, I always miss like a good shawarma. Like a good, mm-hmm. shawarma. you know, like mm-hmm. it's hard to find. Like there is a place... Um, and a good falafel as well. I remember, and you guys, I mm-hmm. assume you guys have lived in Worcester. So like, I didn't live in Worcester, but I went and visited Farah when okay. she was going to school in Worcester. Uh, Farah, for anyone who hasn't heard any of her older podcasts, which shame on you, you need to go listen to it. <laughs> uh, Farah and Ara was our first uh, interviewee and she and I are very old friends. Um, but yeah, when she was living in Worcester, I went and visit her a couple times. I think we actually went, did we get falafel? I don't know. No, it's but like, been a couple years. <laughs> yeah. So what I was going to say is actually like my friends and I would drive all the way to Providence, which is like an hour drive to get falafel because it was like the only legitimate like Arab place we knew that was like good <laughs> enough to be like Middle Eastern level. And for me, that I've never been able to find a place that's as good. And shawarma. So I miss that in the Middle East. And then Honduran food, it's like, 
Uh, Honduran food is very diverse. It's almost like Mexican and Caribbean combined, and there's a lot of like things that are unique to Honduras. But it's hard to find that um, here. But one thing that I always miss about Honduras is like tamales, but like how they're made oh. in Honduras. Those are really hard to recreate, right? Because you need so many ingredients and in that. And uh, mm. the other thing that I always miss is like really fresh tortillas, like um, <laughs> you know that are just made like fully from like white corn. That it's like fresh white corn and it's like done properly. It's not like milled in an artificial manner. Like that's hard. That's even hard to get sometimes mm. in Honduras because they, things have become so industrialized. But uh, but I miss that, and that's just almost impossible to like at least to get here. And, I was and, watching. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. And Belgium has like their like. I mean, maybe this is in Europe and like in general. But at least my impression is that in Belgium, getting Latino food is particularly difficult. That's something that was very impressive to me. Mm. It's like in the U.S., you can always get like Latino food. It's very accessible, even Middle Eastern food, especially if you're in a big city like New York, you can get any food, right? Uh, but right. then I'm. <laughs> I'm here in Belgium and it's like, I was talking to a bunch of friends who've actually lived in Latin America, Belgian friends, and they tell me, oh, it's impossible. Like people have no notion whatsoever mm -hmm. of what like authentic Latino food looks like. And, I, and that, that sometimes is difficult, yeah. I know when I was like, living in Paris, that was our biggest thing that we missed because most other foods we could kind of fill that craving. Paris has a very large Asian community and I say the general, because they really do, mm -hmm. they have a fairly large Japanese population. There's a very big Vietnamese uh, population. Um, so there, there is opportunity to get Asian style food. Um, there is opportunities to get food from um, certain African countries because there's a fairly large, mm -hmm. um, put, like there was a very large number of immigrants that came from North Africa and from the French Horn. And there's also quite a bit of Middle Eastern food because there's a lot mm -hmm. of different communities um, that have moved into France. So that food was very accessible, but any sort of Latino food, forget it. You were just never going to find it. So we would just have to, as best we could, recreate it at home because there was no way we were going to find it on the local market. I don't know how it is in yeah. England. I think it's probably very similar because you don't have that connection in the same way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's easier kind of like the stuff like coming from europe itself it's easier to get hold of that sort of thing and then again the middle east because you know of the history of the empire and all that sort of stuff there, there are people who come <laughs> over from there even things like chinese and japanese food is just not going to be as good it just isn't it isn't going to be as good um britain yeah it tends to look towards the continent more than anything else so that's that's the thing is you can find good restaurants and you can find stuff that would be similar but then because it's so nearby it's going to be easier it's just going to be how it is mm -hmm. i mean british people do still sort of see things like you know like the wines and the cheeses from europe as being the best so they will want mm. to import them that's how they deal with things like that whereas other stuff i think you know that not it is difficult to find so you'd have to make it yourself and even then for some stuff you it's difficult to find the ingredients and all that sort of stuff so you're not going to get it would be harder to make it authentic, I would say. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I mean, like, if I might say something about this, it's like, really interesting that we have, like, and I think anybody who's, like, traveled a lot is a TCK is very keen to, like, being extremely aware of our food. Because, for example, mm. um, and I have, like, multiple observations. I think food for me is one of my biggest expressions. And uh, the first one is <laughs> I learned how to cook abroad. So when I moved to Hon like out of Honduras, I didn't know how to cook properly. I mean, I, I knew how to survive, like, but, like, how to make dishes and how to prepare food. Like, I've come to really hone that a lot, but a lot of the dishes I make now are extremely, like, uh, you know, European or Western, right? It's, like, anything mm -hmm. from a really proper mashed potatoes with the right type of potatoes, right? Like, I can get to choose what the potatoes are here in Belgium, <laughs> for example. Something that you can't really do somewhere else in Honduras. You only have one type of potato, but here it's, like, you can get specific types of potatoes, the ones that are more <laughs> starchy, one of the starchy, you know? And then also... Uh, so like that, I, I sometimes I go back home to Honduras and I'm like, oh man, let me let me let me make this. I have talking to my brother like, let me make this thing I learned how to make in Belgium. It's like a sauce with this. It's semi French, but it also has this. And it's like I'm trying to get. And then I can't find something as simple as shallots. Like shallots are just not a thing in Honduras. Right. And it's crazy to me because it's just like here I can get like twenty shallots for like a euro. And I don't even know what to do with all these shallots, right? Like, and then I go to Honduras <laughs> and it's just like, hey, I need a shallot, and they're like oh, you know, we, what is that? You know, like we have these small red onions and I'm like, it's not the same thing, you know, like, <laughs> uh, and it's just so frustrating. Uh, so that's one thing. And then um, the other thing I was going to say, it's like how, how like opportunistic you become about the food every single time you're traveling. Because when I went to California, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm in California. And it was like, are you going to try the Tex-Mex food? I was like, in the San Francisco Bay Area, right? So uh, I was just like, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to like 
overdose in Asian food. Like, that's what I'm going to do. Like, every time I have a chance, like, uh, I was dating somebody back then, we would go out for, like, just sushi. Like, like the most authentic sushi you could probably get in the U.S. was, like, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Because it's just, like, there's such an Asian community, and it's always had an Asian community. And, and because it always has had an Asian community, like, people have a, have a notion of what good Asian food is. So people mm-hmm. will actually support yeah. good restaurants, and that's, like, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an iterative process. So you don't get like, oh, that's the only good place. It's like, no, you know, there is a competition among which is the best ramen in San Francisco. So, so there is an incentive to become even better, right? Uh, and, and that's always like, for me, it's, you know, people always thought, that's so weird that you're actually going out for that. I'm like, no, because I understand as a, as a person who's like lived in, in multiple places abroad, like how opportunistic you have to be about these things. And the other way around also exists mm-hmm. for me when I came to Europe, like in Honduras, we don't get any of the cheeses, for example, and the wines and stuff like that. And if you do it, they're extremely yeah. expensive. They're like double the price. So for me, it's every single time I go to the supermarket, I'm just like, I'm like worried about my financial statement because I'm just spending so much money on like all these different types of cheeses and like <laughs> things that you can't get in Honduras, like types of olives, types of, uh, uh, you know, and my friends, also my friends here in uni, they're like, are you sure you're a university student? Because you spend like an enormous amount of food, uh, like money on food and and. And I'll like, you know, I'll dish out like the other day, my friend, my friend uh, came, to, we have like, you know, now with COVID, we have a limited amount of contact. So like one of my friends who I have contact with, he came over, we had dinner and I was just like, yeah, we should make something simple. So I remember I seared a steak and made a butter sauce over it and stuff. And he was just like, is this your simple dinner? I'm like, yeah, I mean, you think about it, it's only like maybe five ingredients. And he's looking at him, he's like, really? And I'm like, you don't understand. I take every single chance to make the most European dish ever because these ingredients are impossible to find in Honduras. Like, I'll never find this type of cut of, of meat. I'll never find like fresh thyme like it is here. I'll never find a shallot. You know? so, yeah. you, you better bet that there's going to be a shallot in this sauce, you know? <laughs> So for me, it's uh, yeah. I, 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 for me, that's always been an interesting point, like how opportunistic you can truly be with the food, and how appreciative you become of that. And the more you travel, and the more you start mi- realizing, oh, these things are just here, right? Like no, nowhere else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was gonna say for you, Marcus, when though, you went it? to Japan, you absolutely like went oh, yeah. nuts. <laughs> yeah, I did. Like just because when like 2020, just before everything kicked up with COVID, and goodness me, it was like it was sashimi, it was octopus it was anything i could get my hands on just because you can't get it in the uk there's just nothing like it and it's and it's so widely available so you just go i'm having this now because i know that it's gonna be a long time before i can have it again in a proper form and even if you go to to places in the uk to try and make it yourself it's just like it's difficult to find the things that you really would want to make it kind of how it would be it's it's actually much more difficult than people make out yeah. Even with the even with the supermarkets and stuff, it's just more difficult. Yeah, exactly. For, for example, I was trying to show to my friends what ceviche is, which is like the raw fish, mm. right? And it's just so hard to like find ceviche grade fish here in Belgium, and and and, and like yeah. this type, like lingual, the type of fish that you would use in Peru, for example, or in like uh, in other South American or Central American countries. So I ended up just like choosing, you know, any any random uh, white uh, fish I could find, like that was a uh, flash frozen, mm. because also there is the the fact that you know it has to be both fresh uh, it can be fresh but it also has to be like food grade safe so i mean there's also like mm-hmm. parasitic concerns and uh, as also as a person who's traveled a lot alone i guess you also become extremely like anxious about the fact you can like poison yourself <laughs> so for me it's always i tell myself like i always tell my friends and myself like oh man you know if i can't guarantee this is like the grade i need it i'm not making ceviche and they're like how do you know and i'm like i looked into it you know like to be able to kill the uh, tapeworm eggs you have to like fast freeze it at negative 25 so i'm like looking for a specific item in a foreign language right like just <laughs> an impossible task it's impossible to communicate what you want uh to the people in, like in the store right so it's just a, it's always a, it makes up for a, always a hilarious experience and uh but i, I think ultimately like in belgium is a good place to be like there's such a foreign population like uh, expat population here that mm. people like there's massive like uh groups for every single city like there's a group called like expats in leuven and facebook and i literally just like posted hey i need I posted the question of the fish, which my friends at the time were laughing at me. Like, nobody's going to answer your question about, like, where can you get a white fish for ceviche that has been flash frozen? And I got, like, five actual, like, paragraph long uh, responses about, like, this. Really? Yeah, this fisher gets it, this thing, this person gets it for you. This, you know, you can also use this other fish. Oh, man, this fish is. And everybody's discussing. And I'm not even, like, joining this. Like, it's other people discussing at this point, right? And my friends are just like, I guess all expats must be as weird as you are, like, in their minds. <laughs> It's like, is, is, is raw fish, you know, such a delicacy that you guys can't live without it? I'm like, yeah, you just, because you've never had ceviche, man, so you don't get it. 
<laughs> you don't know the lengths we'll go to to make this dish because exactly. I miss it. <laughs> and then you end up paying like 10 euros for limes, right? Because limes in Latin America are super cheap. cheap and here it's like a euro a lime. And, you, and for the recipe, it's like 35 limes. <laughs> you're like, I don't have that money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you already bought the fish and you're buying the limes and then you realize the limes are going to be more expensive than the fish. And you're at this point, uh, you know, it's just it's all, all everything especially regrets all the feelings happiness sadness regrets no regrets everything um so kind of going on a slightly different topic um do you like traveling like the actual aspect of going from one country to another country and if so what's your favorite part about traveling and what's the thing you hate the most about it This is a hard question because I think traveling is a very um, effort intensive task, right? And I think it really depends on like what you're feeling in your life at the moment. Because if, and I think this is like anybody who's ever moved, you know, like the, the, the circumstances of the move really, um, you know, like they add all this context and all this meaning to like your, 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 uh, your viewpoint, your, your point of view towards like the actual move. If it's going to be a vacation, if you're going with friends, if you're moving towards a better job, for me, like, mm-hmm. or a better opportunity for me, travel is like the best thing. Like, and everything looks positive, right? But then when you do it in a dreadful manner, it can be horrible. And I think especially now with COVID, traveling has become really difficult. Like, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I had an 11 hour flight where I had to keep a mask on. That's like just dreadful, right? Um, and that's not even the longest flight you can be on, right? And yeah. um, so I think it all depends. Do I like traveling? I think, I think like airports, I used to like them. I've come to like them less. Uh, every single time I just see them as a task at this point but if it's like if I'm going to some place if I'm going to one some place new I've never been before and I have some idea of what I want to see extremely exciting and then second if I'm traveling to a place I've been before but I'm traveling with people who've never been there I'm extremely mm-hmm. excited to show them like what I've seen because that's one of the things that I always look back and I think in a very actually almost like melancholic and deep sad ways I always think like I've traveled a lot I've seen a lot I've seen a lot of cities I've, and uh, a lot of my peers back home, a lot of childhood friends, a lot of friends even from undergrad, like they haven't traveled as much as I am. And I tend to be so excited about one, some things that, and it's impossible to me for, for me to explain to them. And that for me has always been like a sad point about like my existence, to be honest. It's like, oh, I can never explain mm-hmm. to you like what I saw here and there in Antwerp or whatever. And uh, so so that, that, that for me, like when I get a chance of like somebody comes to visit me, like the first time my brother ever came to visit me to my undergrad university after four years of me living there, like that for me was just like the best thing ever, right? Like so under those circumstances, like fun, traveling can be so fun. But yeah, it's very circumstantial, right? Like it's, it really depends. I can't be just like, oh, traveling sucks. Even though like with COVID, it's become really, you know, like such a mm. chore. I'm not going to lie. Uh, yeah. I did it like a couple, a couple times uh, and I did the quarantines and everything. And the, yeah, they're not fun, but necessary, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, it all depends on the circumstance. Mm-hmm. But I mean, something I'll always hate is doing TSA. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to find someone who actually enjoys TSA. Like, come at me. Let me know. Send me a message personally. Why yeah, do there's you such like a TSA? difference between moving when you're moving and when you're just going to on a vacation. Because, like, for example, when I moved from uh, California to Honduras just before coming here, actually, I spent like two months and I had all my stuff because I was moving out of California with the plan to go to Hun- to go to Belgium again. But I was doing a pit stop in Honduras. I took all my life and my two bags and everything and my backpack and stuff. And I stopped and they're like, sir, please take off all your electronic devices, right? And I'm like, sure. I'm pulling out my, my work laptop. I'm pulling out my personal laptop. I'm pulling out my Kindle. I'm pulling out my iPad. I'm pulling out all these things. Um, and they're looking at me like, man, really? And I'm just like, yeah, because I'm moving, you know? Like, this is all I have. This is like, this is my personal identity, right? Like, which is something I also came to realize recently, like how important your actual items are the more you move. Like, mm-hmm. your items literally become an impression, and I can't remember which author talked about this, but it's like, or which philosopher says that literally the items you own become like a, your footprint as, a, as an identity, your fingerprint of your identity. But it was just like, uh, because I had this situation where, and I'm getting off track. Well, the whole point is like, I hate, I hate it when you go through TSA and you're moving. There's a difference between that and, oh, I'm going on vacation, and all you have is like maybe your Kindle and your laptop. It's like two electronic devices, and that's mm-hmm. all you have to take out. When you're moving, it's a nightmare. Nightmare. Well, talking about like personal items, I had this bit of a crisis. I, it took me six rebookings to get from uh, Honduras to Belgium this last time, this February. It was massive. Uh, and I was about to just like literally not move. I was just like, you know, forget it. Like, this is, this is what it's going to take. I, I don't care. I, I don't care about my degree anymore. <laughs> I'm just going to drop it. But, um, <laughs> 
at one point I get to, I, I, I traveled four hours to another airport to get on a flight to Belgium. And then when I get there, they tell me that I can only take one of my two checked in bags. And it wasn't made clear to me mm. in my, um, in the check-in online, right? And I had this crisis, right? I had this, I was like, man, I can't leave half of my belongings behind. Because these are the things that I've been chugging along with me for the last four years. Like, <laughs> like the sweater I'm wearing with me has personal, has, has personal, you know, like significance to me. More than like, this sweater has been with me more than people have been with me. You know, like, think about that. Like, uh, and I have to leave it behind. I, I just, I refuse to get on that flight. I was just, I, I came back, I left and, you know, uh, family couldn't go into the airport because of COVID. And my brother's like, what's going on? And I was just so angry. I almost like, I I swear, like if I would have been a bit more angry, I would have probably broken my own windshield of my own car. I was just so angry. And he was just like, he had never seen me this angry. And I was just like, drive back, drive the four hours back to home. And he just couldn't believe it. And I look back and I'm like, I would have never guessed that would have been my response to somebody asking me to leave half of my personal belongings behind because it's Mm. become, you know, such a, like such a, you know, piece of my identity, really, like these things that I carry with me everywhere I go. And it's always, and it's, it's really difficult, right? Because you only have these like limited amount of bags and you're always asking yourself, mm. oh, you know, like, should I take that or should I take this? And then it's a question of what, what do I appreciate more, which is so hard. Like, do I appreciate more this thing that somebody gifted me but has no <laughs> functional use or like, or maybe do yeah. I appreciate more like this other thing, like maybe a notebook that is already full, but it's a diary. Maybe I should digitalize it or, <laughs> or something like that, right? Like, mm. it's always very stressful. But um, yeah, for me, that's I always been like difficult. I suppose, yeah, I, it's the same thing that I think. Like, yeah, I think everybody has that because, like, there are some musical instruments that I had as when I was younger, and then I've managed to get hold of them. And I don't want to be in a situation where I, I'm not with them anymore because they carry sort of a personal. Even if they're not the best musical instruments in the world, they're, they're personal because they, you know they carry memories and all that sort of stuff, and it attaches you to your family and that kind of thing. The item has its own sort of personality because it's been with you for so long or for what whatever reason it's and if somebody asks you to get rid of them or, or would words who ask me to get rid of them i'd be furious as well <laughs> yeah exactly. like it's diff- and then you know what's the worst part of all this as well is that it's not only with the items you already have it's the items that you will acquire because for me there is hmm. a future move and like the horizon right like i might move next year to austria for my master's thesis or i, I might stay here i might move back to the united states later you know for work i don't know um and and it's always like I'm a really big fan of coffee. That's like, well, one thing I explore throughout the world. And I get like, I am very particular about the mugs I get and stuff like that. Like, and I'm always like, man, can, could I take this mug with me? Like, I always think about that. Like, <laughs> am I willing to spend 15 euros in this beautiful piece of art? But like, would I carry it with me? Like, would I, and it's, oh, and I hate that sort of style of life. I've come to hate it. This is one of the things I really hate about traveling. It's not like the actual traveling process. It's like the, the idea yeah. that there's traveling because you're always trying to volumetrically optimize your life. Like that, that's, it's like, maybe that's a very scientific way of putting it, but it's a volumetric optimization of your life. Um, and that for me is very stressful. And, and it, I think it strips away some, some really basic joys. I'll give you an example. One that I've been really struggling with recently is, uh, is the enjoyment of a physical book. I have a Kindle and I carry my library in the Kindle and I've been reading uh, A Little Life. I can't, I can't pronounce it like the author's last name. I'm sorry, but a great book. You should look it up. You know, really good book. And, um, but it's a massive book. It's like 720 pages. So, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, um, would, I, would I ever read that physically? Probably not. Like, you know, and I, but, I, but I'm right now on page 470 or 480 and I'm just like, damn, I just don't want to read on my Kindle anymore. You know, like I want to, <laughs> first of all, sit in a coffee shop, something that is impossible now with COVID. And second, read this in a physical book, you know, and, and that's like something that I think being like a, you know, like a nomad has sort of stripped me of like, uh, and it's the most basic things, but but, you know, but surprisingly, it's things that really could come to annoy you. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. I was going to say, I know that for me growing up, probably the heaviest thing that my family ever brought from country to country to country was our books. And now that I've lived in a place more permanently, I probably will move again. I know that's going to happen, but I can 100% guarantee the heaviest things combined between myself and my partner are our books. And it's actually a really... It's like subconscious. I don't really think about it, but Mm. one of my favorite places I like to go to is this comic book shop. And every time I go, there's this subconscious like discussion that I have with myself where it's like, I really want to read this book. I can't wait to get my hands on it. I want to read it because with comic books, it's very hard to translate to digital unless you're using Mm. like an app that 
that uh, mm-hmm. artists can subscribe can upload their work to but most comics are printed in books and if I want to read it I'm gonna have to buy the book but then there's this internal struggle where I'm like I don't have any more bookshelf space like I am literally now going to have to get another bookshelf because I have that many new books and like for example I just finished reading this incredible comic book called The Black Panther Party um, by David Mm -hmm. F. Walker and Marcus Kwame Anderson fascinating totally interesting I would have never been able to get this digitally but then it's like okay this is another book in my collection and mm. the next time I move, it is going to be the heaviest thing that I'm going to have to move because I just, I can't stop buying books. I just, there's something about the texture, the feel. I have a Kindle. I almost never buy something because I'm like, I just want to feel the book in my hands. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. very frustrating. Yeah, um, I, mean, I When I moved from Worcester to, the, to Honduras after grad university, I shipped all my books. And I remember like multiple boxes got home and my mom was furious. She's like, how much are you pay for this? <laughs> I'm like, and I'm also really particular about the print. I'm like, mom, look, this is an Edward Said copy. Because like, also I'm trying to convince my mom, since that's a Palestinian author. Like, this is an Edward Said philosopher. He's a Palestinian. It's a copy of like, you know, from, from 1997. It has this version with this commentary. You can't really get this. I got it in a thrift shop at the Harvard Bookshow store, you know, store. And my mom's like, I don't care. You know, like. You it's paid, a buck. <laughs> yeah. You paid more for the shipping than the value of the books. It's like, it's the personal value, mom. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Yeah. So. <laughs> I um I am I am curious. Um I know this is kind of shifting a little bit again, but um what's a tradition or another way of like saying is like a quirk that you have from another culture that you carry with you? Like I know for me it's very traditional in Japan, but my family kind of did this no matter what was we um never wore shoes in the house. We just did it. It was mm. a, like I grew up with that. I know from Korea definitely because you don't wear shoes in the house either but I think we did it before not 100% sure but I know that every single place we moved to even when we were living in Guatemala instantly shoes were off do not wear shoes in the house and it was just something we brought with us every place so I guess like for yourself what's a tradition or a quirk or something that you know is characteristic to where you live that you kind of bring with you hmm I don't know, this is a really difficult one because I've, I've struggled a lot, a lot with my identity as both a Honduran and a, and a Palestinian. And I think there was a time that I actually tried to, mm-hmm. like, I would actively reject it. So I was, like, trying to change the way I, I behaved and stuff. Um, one thing that was very made clear to me that, I, that everybody thought was weird is I remember when I arrived to WPI, like Worcester Polytechnic, for my undergrad degree, and I was sitting with all the Latinos, you know, they're trying to, like, talk to the people you sort of feel comfortable with. Uh, I had a friend who's a really close friend now, but I really struggled because um, it was a matter of personal boundaries. As a Palestinian, you would never reach out to the other side of the table. And I imagine there's a lot in a lot of cultures. And you would never pick the food from somebody else's plate. This is like absurd, you know, like you, you just don't do this. Like yeah. we all eat like in really traditional Arab households, like people will eat from a single big plate, but you eat directly what's in front of you, right? You dig in like, you know, just just like uh, linearly inside and then somebody else wants to grab some food it's like hey can you pass me that somebody will, from like their territory pass you let's say a lamb leg or whatever right like mm-hmm. a leg lamb or whatever and my remember my friend Mateo comes in sits down and he really is like yo that looks pretty good let me try and he just like reaches out and he just like <laughs> forks something in my plate and I was just so disgusted like that's the best word to describe it I, my appetite fell. I was just like, damn, I don't want to eat it. Everybody's like looking at all the other Latinos because they're like thinking, oh, man, this guy's from Honduras. He must be Latino like we are. But it's like, for me, it's like, oh, wow. And I, and I came to realize like, wow, I've been dealing with a, even in, in Honduras, there isn't a big like second generation Palestinian community, but there's a big third and fourth generation Palestinian community. So I used to get along with people who like call themselves Palestinians, but they may, may, might not actually speak Arabic or, or know a lot about the culture, but you retain these quirks, right? So like people are still very... Mm-hmm. The way they sit down in the table is very like formal and stuff, right? And um, and I was just going nuts. And I remember that 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 uh, that was something I retained, and it took me forever to get used to uh, my friend Mateo actually just barging into my house and eating my stuff. Like it would take me forever. And he was like, "Yo, chill. We do this all the time. You can come into my house when you want." And I'm like. I won't. Oh, I won't, right? I won't first and then second also because I would buy very particular things. We already had the conversation about food. It's like, I don't want the things you have, you know? Like, <laughs> I, I'm so sorry to break it up. So put it like that, you know? But it's the way it is. I don't want your garbage food. I want yeah, my so, food. 
<laughs> he came to visit me in 2019 here in Belgium, and when he left, uh, this was one of the biggest things. We were both really big fans of dark chocolate. He would just eat through my dark chocolate when we were in undergrad. And I told him here in Belgium, you still owe me, man, big time for all the dark chocolate. He walked into a, like a supermarket and he bought like 15 bars or something of dark chocolate. And he was just like, here it is. Don't ever mention it again. I'm tired, man. That was years ago. And I was just like, success. He paid back all his, what he owned. I was just such a, such a sense of victory. But that's one thing, I guess. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, one thing about like uh, that I still carry with me. I guess it's, oh, I mean, now I'm a lot more chill about this. I don't really mind it. Um, but I think, you know, if anybody is like, if I'm not particularly close to somebody and somebody does that, I would still be like, oh, like, you know, a little bit weeded <laughs> out by it. The other thing I've yeah. also come to realize, and this is something that, um, you know, obviously when you start going to other countries, you meet people who are maybe from your same like background culture, but like lived in the other country. So when I first arrived to the United States, I started meeting a lot of Palestinians and a lot of other people. I was very impressed about how in the United States, a lot of times, like there's a lot, uh, the, the idea of being like a second generation immigrant, it's like, tied with being like accepting of yourself, self-care and stuff like that. And that for me was very interesting because when I was growing up as a Palestinian in Honduras, uh, it was very much taught that Palestinians strap themselves by the boots, you know, by their, like strap their boots or whatever the expression is and like, you know, just deal with life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There isn't, you know, a lot of like moaning around about like, oh, you know, life is unfair, blah, blah, blah. It's like this idea of like, nobody's going to help you out except yourself. My mom used to actually tell me this. Nobody's going to help you out except yourself. And, uh, and, you know, and us Palestinians, we are where we are, not because somebody had pity on us. On the contrary, mm -hmm. every, everything was set mm -hmm. against us. And we are here because we've done a good job. So I came to the U.S. and I think I was, uh, this was a very big learning process for me, uh, like more, like deeply, right? Because I used to be so, uh, until this day, I, t I tend to be not forgiving to myself, you know? And I think that's because uh, there's such a, already like an expectation as a Honduran Palestinian specifically uh, to like have this like, you know, hard-headed idea of like if you're gonna make it in life it's because it's all about you you know you're, you're gonna life i mean obviously there is this idea of like destiny and stuff like sometimes the Palestinian culture and like what god wants right and stuff like that but but the idea is that you know ultimately you you take whatever chance like god gives you or whatever right like it's just there and you should take it and you should be there ready for it like there is no pity nobody's gonna like feel pity for you in life and for me that was very different i met a lot of palestinians and like even other kids who are second generation immigrants and a lot of them were like you know, they would throw words around, not, not to say that they have no meaning, but like, you know, they talk about like generational trauma, for example. And this for mm -hmm. me was just like, like it just sounded like a, like almost like a, like an escape goat, you know, coming from a, such a hard-headed place, you know, like, what are you going to talk like generational trauma, like trauma, are you, are you ungrateful for what your parents did? It's, you know, mm. like, like, you know, that, like, mm. obviously now I look back and, you know, that's extremely judgmental from my part, but, but that was a, like something I also like, that, that like, you know, going back to your original question, there are the behavioral quirks like that. And then there's also like the deep identity. Like this is, this is for me is relevant, right? The mm. deep identity aspect. That was something that was really clear to me that I carried with me. And it's been, it's been hard to actually uh, recognize that this in myself and also be able to, um, to realize that, you know, it could be, it can be a good thing. It can drive you to good places, but at the same time, when you're alone, when you're in a foreign country, you know, self-care, self-care self is important, right? So you can't just, you know, burn yourself out as well. Mm -hmm. There's, mm, yeah. it yeah. sounds like a lot of it was uh, such a stress on self-reliance and on the inner, on working within the inner group that there was very little, I will accept help from the outside because if I accept help from the outside, then I cannot rely upon myself. Well, it's not necessarily that. I think also there's just this realization that there really isn't, help from the outside you know like mm. the palestinian narrative i don't think is one that has become really empathizing to palestine until recently you know like mm -hmm. maybe you look back 10 years ago 20 years ago like there weren't a lot of articles defending the palestinian community and then if they were they weren't on like big mm -hmm. newspapers like the new york times you know it's mm -hmm. the younger population who are like oh man you've seen what people have done to palestine like that's unfair right so when you're growing up let's say my father's generation my father went, you know, through World War II. He went through the British Mandate. He went through, like, also the, the start of the Israeli, like, uh, conflict and all those things. And, and when things were in black and white, nowadays people pitch the Israeli conflict as much more black and white, which it isn't, right? But, you know, my dad grew up beside uh, his best friend and neighbor when he was growing up was, was Jewish. Because back then there was just, like, the, British, the Palestinian British Mandate and Jews and, and, and Muslims and Christians lived side by side. Um, and, and, and you see all that, right? There's this idea that, you know, like, when you look at all that real reality and you look back, you realize like these people were just off on their own, you know, like all the things were against them. So it's not that, oh, I can't rely, 
I can't rely, you know, among my community or somewhere else. I might be, I might be cast, you know, cast out, you know, ostracized. I don't think that was the reality. On the contrary, I don't think anybody was offering help. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, the quality of life of the world has improved. A lot of people forget this. People talk about how bad life is, mm -hmm. but like I remember, my dad would always tell, like, tell me, "Oh no, you know, when I was a kid, there wasn't a polio vaccine." I was like, "Oh, it's crazy to me. Man. There was no polio." <laughs> yeah, vaccine, that's pretty right? wild. <laughs> you know, like. Because my dad, he lived till he was 92, but like, and he like lived through all these different, you know, experiences, wars and stuff. And he would always tell me like, it's no polio vaccine. I lost, I lost two siblings to disease, you know, uh, people didn't really know what was up with a lot of stuff. And, and he would always tell me sort of these like stories and, um, and, and yeah, you, you think about that. I don't think anybody back then sort of like had any bandwidth to spare you know <laughs> to be honest yeah yeah right so uh especially to a foreigner who like just showed up or i mean not to say that people were not yeah. good-hearted right but it's just the reality is that you know the world was less globalized people were less aware of what's going on across the world and stuff so so i mean mm -hmm. i i would imagine my dad's for example experience moving from pasta in honduras must have been extremely different than me mm -hmm. like you know imagine just coming on and being cut off to the world like, you know, I complain about the language. I can always just get on a FaceTime call and talk to a friend who speaks my language. Uh, mm -hmm. But my dad, you know, shows up to Honduras, doesn't speak, Ar like maybe there's one or two other Ar Arab immigrants and it's him, you know, has to learn Spanish and like get used to that, right? Uh, that's just, you know, like very, like that, that changes your own perception of yourself. Mm -hmm. Like it does. Mm -hmm. You know, you look back, you probably think of yourself as like somebody who like relied on himself versus and I always tell people like this, it's like when I came to the U.S. as well, there was like the international office. They talked about like, you know, uh, culture shock and all these things. And like they made it really, the support, you know, they can talk to come to a counselor. And I'm like thinking, yeah, my dad had none of that, you know, like <laughs> he couldn't call home, right? Like, uh, so I think this is where it comes from, um, ultimately. Mm -hmm. hmm. Um, so moving forward with it, as a TCK, do you... I mean, it sounds you've kind of answered it, but I, I think it is an interesting question in itself is as a TCK, do you find yourself trying to conform or do you find yourself wanting to stick out? Is there do you try and fit yourself into the culture that you are living in or do you find yourself on purpose standing out as like part of your person? I know for me, I think that in some way subconsciously I try to conform but I think generally I try and stand out because I know that I'm never really going to fit in so why like try and like force myself into this box of requirement which I know I will never that will never happen and I think Marcus you and I when we talked about this you're in the same mindset where it's like you're not yeah. really going to conform yeah, it's it's just partly because you can't. I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's just an interesting question because you, you, you sort of feel like you do have, you want to sort of fit in to an extent, but the problem is people just call out, well, not call out, but they point out things that you do that they don't do. Mm -hmm. And it must it must happen to so many people because if it happens to me on a regular basis when people suddenly go, well, that's, you know, different groups of people will point out things that are different. It's just, it must, I don't know, I'm assuming it happens to pretty much everybody that there's, there's a kind of a tension. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that fully, and I think I think there are certain experiences I've lived through that just have taught me that there are mo there are moments to be yourself, and there are moments to conform. Obviously, uh, when it's a mo like example here in Belgium, when there's a bunch of Belgians, and I'm speaking, I don't speak, you know, uh, Flemish, and you know, I won't try to like force a conversation into English, like or something like that. Of course, um, mm -hmm. I'm respectful for all those cultural boundaries. At the same time, I don't, I'm not trying to like, you know, be Belgian or anything like that. And I think, and I think. What I've come to realize is like there are things that I really enjoy about certain cultures and, I, and there are things that I deeply like reject. And I like, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, and and I'll give you an example. Like I don't like here in Belgium at universities, for example, that barely very people ask questions. Very people like very little people do. And um, and I hate that. And I'm always asking questions. And I think people actually got caught on now. Like oh, even the Belgian students ask a lot of questions because it's just it makes more sense. You know, they realize like, oh, man, I should just yeah. ask if I don't understand. That for me is like, I'm never trying to conform there. Like, I'm not intimidated by the professor. I don't care if he looks at me and he thinks probably that oh, I'm in the stupid American, right? Like, or whatever. Because I sound, I, also that's something that's really confusing to people. It's like, I sound extremely American, even though I'm not. Um, mm -hmm. And and there's that, you know. And then, yeah, it's like, once you talk, that's one of the points that people always point out. It's like, well, that's weird. You speak English really well, and then you're not American. Like, what's up, you know? Or like, all the way around, or, or whatever. And um, And I think that's, but for me, it's always like, there are things that even in my home cultures, I don't appreciate. Like, I remember, um, I've always been really inquisitive of my own home culture, home religion, 
But I've had a lot of like encounters with my own family about like how critical I can be of it. Like, um, there was a time I never thought of Arabic or Spanish as like superior languages to English. I never did, you know, like this is why I try to hold my English so well. And I don't think this is, you know, like an uh, accurate thing. I think I was just young and like, you know, confused. Uh, mm. And, um, and I would, and I would always be like, oh man, you know, but the Arabs do it that way. You know, like other people in developed countries do it differently because that's different. I'm, I'm a TCK of two, you know, like countries that are not per se developed, right? Or Western or whatever you want to call mm. them. So the experience there is very different, for example, than being like a second generation immigrant in, in the United States, right? Where like the United States is like, let's say an icon of the world and then your family's from Palestine or Algeria or, or India or whatever, right? Like, no, it's like you look down like Honduras is this country known for being the most violent country in the world. And then Palestine has like known to be occupied and has, have, has the second world pa worst world passport. In, like, you know, it's like only followed by South Sudan. So there's nothing to look... It was very hard as a kid to look down into my cultures and say like, oh man, I'm so proud to be that, right? Because there was nothing truly like that would stand out. And also as a person who wanted to do science, it was very difficult to find a scientific uh, culture and history in my cultures as well. Like um, there wasn't, you know, like there's no big uh, Nobel Prize winners coming out of Honduras or Palestine, right? Or stuff like that. It was until a lot later that I became a lot more knowledgeable and started reading about Palestinian authors and stuff that I realized, oh, there is a, there is a cultural inheritance that isn't just folkloric music you know there are modern philosophers that talk about mm -hmm. world issues and stuff and that was very interesting to me but it took a while and and for me like i would reject this like i would really just refuse to speak arabic at home for example um ref refuse the notion that i could ever date a middle eastern woman for example like just refuse it you know like and I, and and it was it was it was intense and i look back and i'm like wow like i, I had to go through that and, you know and to realize that i had to become also disappointed with with my 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 idealism of other cultures as well to realize mm -hmm. that oh man you know every single culture has and i think that became that became more of a thing uh, once i moved to europe and i realized like man this place is great i'm not gonna say it's not but there are big things that i don't like about this place and um and not that they're better or worse they're just like different they're just not the, my preference right and it's the same thing about the united states the same thing about honduras the same thing about palestine right so it took a while but um, and this is where you know when you ask the question of like do you accept you try to fit in it's Again, it's very circumstantial and it depends point by point. But I think the thing that I appreciate the most in anybody, as a friend, even as a partner, as anything, is, is I've come to realize is this awareness that mm -hmm. I am not, mm -hmm. um, that I'm not like, let's say, just a product of my cultures, right? Uh, that I am much yeah. more than that. And I am critically thinking. And uh, uh, the previous person I was dating, I think, was very, um, was very aware of this. And I was very appreciative of that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, through that relationship, I came to realize that it's not something I only look forward in relationships. I also look for, I, look, I, look, I appreciate this in, in friendships as well. And uh, even, even with my, my mom, for example, now when we talk, she's come to also realize that I'm not just a product of Honduras and Palestine. Like I've lived abroad so long that like sometimes I'll switch to English and she's like, oh wow, you know. Um, so I, I become really appreciative of that. <laughs> but, but yeah, definitely, definitely like, you know, there, there isn't just a straight up answer to that. It depends. But I'll, I'll, I'm yeah. I'm very verbal when it comes to something I don't like. For example, I've called I've okay. called out people on things that I think is racism here in Belgium, even though people will tell yeah. me, yeah, people will tell me, you know, no, it's not racism. It's not like it's not like we're doing the United like in the United uh -huh. States, you know. And I'm like, yo, dude, no, this is maybe an institutional racism, but like acting like that is is cultural racism, you know? Because I think there's there's difference mm -hmm. like between. Uh, and this is why I also don't like when people just generalize again. Uh, social civil civil issues civil uh, problems and civil rights issues in around the world they're contextual again and i've seen it on both sides where americans will generalize situations in in um in europe depending on american standards and the other way around but i don't like this idea that some people actually do call themselves exempt on these problems right it's like come on man like i mean i know we're in the 21st century <laughs> but like that the notion that you live in a utopia it's, it's hard no, to sell no you know? that's not how it works sorry <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. there is no utopia right now <laughs> Yeah, so I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll reject, you know, these sort of things for sure, you know. <laughs> um, mm. So we're, we're getting close to the end, but I do have one last question for you, because I think it is something that um, it, we, we've we lived through it and we know what it's like coming out uh, of, you know, having been in TCK and where we've lived. But uh, what advice do you have for a young person, uh, be it a child or a teenager, whatever it may be, who is going to move to a new country? 
either this is their first move or this is their 40th move, whatever it is. That's a lot for a young person. <laughs> but like, what would, advice do you have for a young person who is going to be moving to a new country? I would argue that um, it depends on why you're moving what and like what you're trying to gain from it or, or, or lose from it or whatever. But I would argue one has to be critical about his interpersonal relationships in this regard. It was very clear to me. I've been reading um, Together by Vivek Murphy, a really good book as well. Uh, it talks about loneliness. And I was using as a person who travels a lot, like this is an issue I deal with a lot personally. And he makes a difference between three levels. I don't think it's, it's him personally. I think he cites a paper, but the whole point is like there's three levels of, of loneliness, like a three, three, need, three levels of need, of social need. There's like intimacy, friends and family, and then community and like the idea of a country maybe or something bigger. Um, it's important to cre think critically and be able to distinguish, I, I'd argue, uh, between these needs. I've been a lot in situations where I'm very frustrated because maybe the, commun the community and, 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 ident and, and political identity or something like that, personal aspect of me is not satisfied. And, 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 I, and I find it hard to distinguish that uh, bet, uh, from, from I'm not satisfied with my friendships. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. I think that's like my recommendation to uh, people who are going to travel and maybe like uproot themselves, right? Uh, it is dangerous to do so, but it, it, one has to, be, has to look within to be able to say like, you know what, these are my specific needs and work them. Because one has to be proactive and one has to be able to... Uh, to yeah. One has to be proactive and one has to be able to actually like attend to these needs. Yeah, do you need new friends? You make sure that you know, you're attending to the need of new friends and not maybe the need of a personal intimate relationship or the other way around. Do you need a sense of community? Join a community, you know? Uh, mm. Don't expect that your sense of community is going to come from your Friday night beers with your peers. Because you know? it might not. It might, it might, you know, but it might not, right? Like there's, there's a difference between those levels of fulfillment. And that, that, would, that, that for me is like my advice. It's, it's be aware of the nature uh, of the fulfillment you seek and, and, and be active and, and, and act upon that and, and then don't, don't confuse and, and complain about maybe uh, about like oh man but my friendships aren't giving me what I need maybe your friendships just are not the thing th that you should be expecting yeah, to, you, know, the, mm. you shouldn't expect your friends to give you whatever you know fulfillment you want in that regard very, I think that's mm -hmm. a very important thing to keep in mind Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's actually really important advice because it's one of those things that you don't think about it because you just hope that when you arrive somewhere that everything's going to slot into place. And I suppose it does actually take work to try and find people and meet people and make sure that you are sort of looking at yourself and how what you want from the situation, but also, you know, understanding that other people don't have to give you things if they don't, you know, that it's not their job to give you stuff. Uh, but also, you know, you have to be willing to give to people as well. I suppose it's a difficult one when you move, isn't it? Because it's like trying to set up that kind of sense of community and stuff like that can take a bit of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's difficult. That's always been difficult for me because I've been moving like, let's say, mm. every six months to a year. And mm. it, was, it was very clear to me at one point that like I was failing in these three regards. And, and I was, until I read the book, I was like, man, I am, now I, I sort of understand why I'm so unfulfilled. It's not, that, it's not that my friends, you know, abroad are making me feel unfulfilled. No, it's like, Maybe I do, you know, lo long for a more personal relationship, right? Like an intimate relationship. Maybe I do mm -hmm. long for a sense of community, right? Because you know, I, some people can sell this idea that you're a global citizen. You know, some people are very comfortable with that. I personally might not be. Uh, but that's the reality, right? And, and uh, just it's important to keep in, that in mind because I think these can be a big driver on like what you want to do next. I think if you asked Shai from two years ago, would you move to a random country again? I would have said yes. Now... I'm much more critical and I think, oh, you know, like if I move again, will I even be able to continue to develop a sense of community? Maybe not. You know, maybe that's important, right? I don't want to find myself being 35 and just feeling like I have nowhere to be for no reason. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, mm -hmm. for me, that's a very scary yeah. thought, right? Like this idea that there is nowhere to be for no, and no reason at all to be anywhere uh, can mm -hmm. be scary. Some people are like, you know, long for that sense of freedom. For me, it's like, I know I'm a... Maybe it's engineering me. I, I, I look for a sense of purpose in, in life or something. But, uh, but yeah, I but mean, just keep... I, w I would say...
would say I, I totally agree with that. I think for me, when I first moved back to the States, I was very apprehensive because I didn't feel American. I didn't feel French. I didn't feel like anything of these cultures that I had grown up with. I felt like this mashup of everything. So when I moved back, there was this, this kind of fear of, oh, what is going to be expected of me because I act and look American, whatever that means. Um, but I, I'm i definitely not going to fit the mold that people are going to expect of me. And I think over time, by, you know, reminding myself that I need to be myself, I need to accept that I'm a little bit of everything, but I still want to find that sense of community. I still want to be able to mm-hmm. reach out and talk to other people um, I know with COVID, it's actually been a moment where I realized how much I really relied on the peop- on the community that I have built now that I'm in this city, because there are these people that, even if I wouldn't consider myself a close friend of theirs, I saw them often enough and they mattered to me enough that now that I don't see them on a fairly regular basis, I miss them. I miss that mm. community that I had built. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think when I went back to Honduras right now, even over over COVID, and I was meeting people at a distance. It was just very refreshing to me to be like, "Oh wow, I know I don't talk to you, and we're so different like that often." But it's like we we share this sense of like, there's something that is common in us. Maybe it's the language, maybe it's the fact that we grew up together or something, right? But it's like this idea, right? And just keeping that in mind, you know, keeping keeping in mind your personal needs and like what can provide each, what can fulfill each need, and uh, and everything. And that's really important, right? Because the reason you move is especially as an adult, tends to be like, let's say you're moving for a partner, you're moving for work, you're moving for education. And there's so much more to life that like that one single thing that you're moving mm-hmm. for, probably, you know. Yeah. Um, but then again, and I, 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 I don't have an answer for this, right? Like it's a personal choice, but like is, is, is that one thing worth, you know, like, uh, like gambling on the rest? Yes or no, you know? And what, and again, like is... Is your move mutually exclusive with the rest? I don't think so. But it definitely is if you don't try, right? If you move, let's say, for your Mm. master's degree and you don't try to fill in the holes of friends, community, personal relationships and other stuff, maybe mentorship. um, Yeah, I I think that can be dangerous. At least for me, I think like when I was, when I moved to the US, I remember I, and this was the weirdest thing I never thought I would miss. I missed hanging out with older people being on like mm. campus mm. because it was like, you know, I could just really use some advice right now. And there was nobody except like people on this, my same age who could give me that advice. And this goes back to the point of community, right? Like, like, you know, like, oh man, I, and, and that was something that now when I'm in Belgium, like I try to not be like, oh, I'm a student. I'm going to live a student life. Like, no, you know, I'm, I'm a guy in Belgium. I'm, a, I'm young. Yeah, sure. I want to meet people who are older, who are younger, who have different aspirations. You know, I want to have close friends I can trust. I want to have like, you know, uh, you know, like I'm open to like maybe having a relationship here, even though I'm, I move or not, you know, like, I don't know. But the whole point is I'm actively like critical about like the interactions I'm having. I'm not being too passive about it. It's like I meet a guy who I really like. I'm like, yo, you can be my friend, you know, like I, I, can, I can see myself like <laughs> hanging out with you not just being like a classmate or whatever. I, um, you know, I, I meet somebody who's older. I can like, hey, you know, that can be a professional peer. You know, why not? Not, not just like, mm-hmm. oh, that's a guy I met once, you know, I'll move away. It doesn't really matter, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think I think ultimately the the most important thing about this is also this is your in into any country as well, right? If you have nothing attaching you to a country, uh, it's just going to be like a touristy spot for you, unfortunately, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think at the end of the day, I don't know if everybody like obviously people have different reasons to travel, but like I, I would imagine a lot of people who listen to this podcast, you know, have have emotional attachments to like the places they want to be in, and I think as an adult. Um, it's a bit more difficult to like have that emotional attachment maybe because when you're a kid, you go and it's like, oh, that's where I grew up. That's a place I grew up in, right? It's like easy to remember, to reminisce. But as an adult, it's like, that's a place I worked for in, for two years. It was okay, you know, because I've had that, right? Like I've, I've lived like some places I worked there and it's like, it was okay. You don't want that to be your story. Like I remember I lived in this place called Jamestown, Massachusetts. Sorry, Jamestown, New York. It's in Western New York State, like almost by Erie, Pennsylvania. And I look back and I made all these mistakes I'm talking about. And I look back and I'm like, man, Jamestown sucked. It's not that it sucked. It's just like I didn't know anybody and I was just not trying to meet anybody, right? I just being, I was just like a scared guy, blah, blah, you know, like. And I look back and I'm like, yeah, I could have done a better job by realizing like 
realizing that my job there wasn't giving to provide me all the friends I needed, you know, like realizing that uh, mm. I needed to meet people that I, all the people I knew were older. I needed people who are my age. I needed to meet people who are younger than me. I needed to meet people uh, who I can like maybe I could like actually confide with, like, you know, like a friend. Yeah, I didn't do that at all. Uh, and I look back and I'm like, yeah, I'm so glad I learned my lesson. Now in Belgium, I'm trying to do a better job at that. I'm, you know, I'm reaching out. It's hard, obviously, with COVID and actually meet people. We meet outside in the cold of weather, rain. Um, <laughs> Freezing. Hello, how are you? It's, it's yeah. very nice to be friends, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, you know, we try. So <laughs> that's my advice. <laughs> well, thank you, Shadi. This has been very, very fun. It has been lovely really speaking to you and doing this. Um, so I just want to encourage everyone, uh, definitely leave us a comment or review. We're anywhere where you can find wonderful free podcasts. Um, and that's part of it. It's free. Um, so uh, if you want to reach out to us, we are on Twitter. It is Passport N-E-C-E-S-S-1. Don't know why that's what we got, but it's what we got, and we're rolling with it. <laughs> <laughs> I Twitter is a hellscape. Um, but anyway, uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'm on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for uh, joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.